Hello everyone. How are you people of God? It is Lakedra. I have an encouraging word of empowerment that is going to build your faith and bring joy and strengthen you. We are going to talk about how do we know we have received what we have prayed and asked for. This is going to be an exciting message, people of God. So many of you all are going to be so uplifted as I take you through the word of God and just allow it to speak to us and to show us how do we know we have received what we have prayed and asked for. Because I know many of us are wondering, Lord, you said when we pray, believe we receive. But how can we believe we receive we have received something we don't see. And so that's what we are going to get into today or this evening or on tonight, wherever you are, hallelujah, in the world. People of God, you're going to be so encouraged. So thank every one of you all for joining me, my first timers and new subscribers. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. Many of you all that are standing and fighting for your marriage and for the salvation of your spouse. God bless you. And you know, I just thank you all for sharing your comments, people of God, your prayers and even your gifts in the work of God, your seed. God bless you. May the Lord continue increasing and prospering you. And I will be praying with you all and over you and just applying the blood and allowing God to just show up in our lives as we pray and come together in prayer, hallelujah. So thank you all so much for joining me. I wanna jump right into the, the word of God, hallelujah. It's going to really bless you. Let's go to it in Mark. Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Many of you all remembers this verse, but I want us to go over it again. Remember what Jesus said. And this is in the New Living Translation. He says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. And so many of us have read this verse and you may be asking, Lord, okay, I've prayed, but how can I know that I've received what I've asked for? Because I don't see it. I don't see it look like things has gotten worse. What can help me, Lord, believe that I've received it so it can be mine, so that I can see these things come to pass? Okay, people of God, well, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the Word of God. The Word of God is what will answer our questions and will show us and teach us everything there is to know. And so, first of all, let's look at it in Galatians. Galatians chapter 4 gives us the foundation to believe God that when you've prayed, you have received what you've asked for. So we want to look at that in Galatians chapter 4. And I want to start in verse 4. Then we'll come back to this other verse I want us to look at. But it says, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. So, so for one, those that are in Christ Jesus are God's children and have been given freedom and no longer up under the curse of the law that had condemned us all to die. And this is a spiritual death. It means where a person is separated from God outside of the kingdom cannot come before the Lord except there be repentance. So this curse was spiritual death that the law had us up under. So this is what Paul is talking about. This law. The curse of the law. God has saved us from it. Hallelujah. And we all was up under the curse because no one could obey the law. Only Jesus Christ. And so to save us from death, the Lord sent his son. So now we can receive the blessing. The curse has been reversed, praise the Lord. 
So this is what Paul was talking about. Those that could not keep the law and neither one of us could do it. We was up under the law to, to die spiritually. All right. And so it says, and because we are his children in verse six, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own children. And since you are his children, God has made you his heir. And so the life of Christ has become ours. We now can walk into the riches and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want us to look at it in verse 1. He says, think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their father had. So Paul is showing us that until we can know who we are, know what we have been given from our Father, and have spiritually come to that revelation, we'll stay in bondage. We won't be able to receive. We won't be able to believe God for anything that we are asking Him for. Because you don't know who you are. You don't know if God is able to do it. You don't know if you're worthy. You know, all these things the enemy can use against us. And so you won't be better off than a slave or outside child that doesn't belong to God. Yet you own everything. Yet these benefits are yours. The promises are yours. They are yes and amen to those that are in Christ Jesus. And so the Lord's word is showing us if we think like a slave because of our unbelief, we'll live as a slave that cannot receive the inheritance, and yet we own it. We own them all. It is God's will that you prosper in your marriage. It is God's will for you to be able to pray and ask Him of anything, and it be yours. It is His will that you receive whatever you ask for. But then He says in verse two, they have to obey for this person to receive. He says they have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it was with us, it says, before Christ came. We were like children. We were like slaves to the basic principles, spiritual principles of this world. But Paul is telling us when Christ came, God adopted us as his own. Those that received him and believed upon him became the children of God. The Bible tells us this as well in John chapter 1. And so we now are joint heirs with Christ. And as you know who you are in Christ, you know, therefore, that when you prayed unto him, he will give you whatsoever you ask for. So this lays the foundation, first of all, and allow you to see God's love for you and shows you who you are in Christ Jesus. It renews our minds. So you won't be thinking like a slave or someone that is not seen worthy unto God or someone that can't boldly feel like they can't ask God for anything and boldly come to the throne of grace. If you think like a child, you think God is against you and you don't know who you are. You don't know your identity in Christ. You won't feel like the kingdom is yours. You won't feel like God can restore your marriage. You won't feel like that what you're praying for God is even hearing you. If you think that there is a distance there, if you don't feel that you are seen as God's children, my Lord, Paul said you won't be better off than a slave. How can you receive even salvation if you don't know what has been given unto you? Praise the Lord. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, let's go back. John the apostle says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. So we have eternal life, those that are in Christ Jesus. And we are confident, he says in verse 14, that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. So he hears us that are in Christ Jesus that have eternal life. Remember, we are no longer slaves. We have this inheritance. 
where we can come to the Lord and ask of anything that pleases him, anything that's concerning his word, which is his will for our life. Remember, that's what the Lord says. You can pray for anything. And when you believe, you receive that it will be yours. So the Lord is saying, first of all, find out who you are. Once you find out who you are, there is going to be a list of all the things that I've given you. Number one, you have eternal life. Number two, you can ask of anything in my name that pleases me. And then look at what Paul says. Look at what John the Apostle says. And since we know he hears us, in verse 15, when we make our request, we also know that he would give us what we ask for. So, people of God, this is one of the ways you can know that you receive what you've asked for. Number one, you have this inheritance through Christ Jesus who purchased your freedom so you will no longer be bound or as a slave, but you have been adopted. You have been ad adopted to become God's dear children and you have received the Holy Spirit in you which made you an heir with Christ Jesus. And so now you can come and ask of anything and he will hear you, but you must know it. You see, you have to know who you are. You have to come to the knowledge of truth. And this is how you are able to believe that you have received. This is how you are able to believe that you are going to receive what you've asked for. But if you don't have the knowledge if you don't come to the knowledge of truth, first of all, of seeing who you are, what all you have been given and why, and now how to receive it. Until you can come to that truth, it will be hard and difficult to believe the word of God. You have to see it all plain through the scriptures. And so we who are in Christ Jesus can ask of anything according to his word, according to what pleases him, and God would hear us. And you might say, well, Lakeidra, how do I know that this is God's will for my marriage? Well, God is big on marriages. He created them. Let's go to the word of God. Let's look at it and see what his will is. Number one, we're going to look at it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 10, I want to start there because we're going to look at every scenario, every situation that fits you, that may pertain to your situation. That way you'll know what to do. Now, verse 10 in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 tells us, but for those who are married, I have a commandment that comes not from me, Paul says, but from the Lord. A wife must not leave her husband. But if she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to him. And the husband must not leave his wife. And so in some cases, some people have to come out due to abuse, through constantly adultery, unfaithfulness, emotional abuse, whatever there may be. And you may be saying, look, I, I just can't handle this, Lord. I, I just want to come out. I need to separate out of this. I, I just need to just come out of this situation now. Well, the Lord is saying through, through his word. If you do, remain single or else be reconciled back to him, your husband, or you, man of God, back to your wife. Because the Lord do not want that one to move on remain single or else be reconciled god wants you back with your spouse that you are committed and you have made a vow to okay and so now i want to move on now he says i will speak in verse 12 to the rest of you though i do not have a direct command from the lord it is if a christian man has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to continue living with him, he must not, not leave her. So Paul is not giving us a commandment, but he's giving us wisdom and guidance. And the scripture says, this wisdom can be trusted. 
this wisdom can be trusted. So he's given us wisdom. Hallelujah. And so he says, if a Christian man has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to continue living with him, he must not leave her. And in verse 13, and if a Christian woman has a husband, has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. For the Christian woman, a wife, brings holiness to her marriage. And the Christian husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy, but now they are holy. So he's saying through you, your life, through those that are in the household with you, can come up under this same grace by watching you. Your life can provoke them. Or win them over to the Lord by them watching you. That holiness upon you can touch their hearts and bring them to Christ. Through the wisdom and the knowledge of God, he'll show you how to win them over by them watching your lifestyle. That holiness upon you and you standing in the gap for them and you praying for them and you living the life in front of them is what can cause holiness. To touch your spouse and bring your children as well up under that same anointing. This is what would cause your whole house to get saved. But there is another situation Paul talks about. Now this is if someone is in the home and the husband is an unbeliever or the wife is an unbeliever. But yet you, are, you all are living together. But you are saved and they are not. And so if they are willing to still stay in the home, it's just that they are, they are an unbeliever. They are not a believer. They are not saved. But they are willing to live with you and stay in the home and be married. You know, there are a lot of couples that are in that situation where the unbelieving spouse can still live peacefully in the home with her husband, who is an unbeliever. Or the man of God can still live peacefully with his wife who's an unbeliever. There are a lot of couples like that. And then after a while, that unbelieving spouse comes to the Lord. It usually turns out later on like that. That's what happened with me. My husband wind up rededicating his life years ago. Back in 2002, 2001. And it wasn't long after I came in behind him. It was like two weeks later. So when I saw him dedicate his life to the Lord, that's what brought me back to him. So you see, and I've been saved ever since. But anyway, that that happens. It, it just happens. God's begin, God begins to touch the spouse who is an unbeliever's heart. He begins to deal with them. But Paul talks about this one. He says, but if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the Christian husband or wife is no longer bound to the other, for God has called you to live in peace. Meaning God has called you. You don't need to try to make your spouse stay or force them to serve God or force them. To do whatever it is we want them to do. For God has saved us. He has called you. To have peace with him. And Paul says. Don't you wives realize. Your husbands. Might be saved because of you. And don't you husbands. Realize. That your wives. Might be saved because of you. Each of you should continue. To live in whatever situation. The Lord has placed you in. And remain as you were when God first called you. This is my rule for all the churches. So whatever situation you are in now, the husband or the wife may have left out of the home. Well, remain. Remain in that situation. Remain where you are. Continue standing. Remain being that believer. Remain abiding in Christ Jesus. Don't you change you stand because through you, that spouse.
can be saved if you stand hallelujah praise the lord it'll come through you your prayers your interceding on their behalf praise the lord god will bring them back not only to you but to him which is more important than anything and so we who are in christ jesus remember we have been given an inheritance well, we can pray and ask God for anything that pleases him. And he will give us whatsoever we ask. We who are born again. We who have been called to have peace with God. We who are the believers. Hallelujah. We have this authority. We have the benefits of Christ. Remember, we are joint heirs with him. We are his sisters and brothers. And we have the same father. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Through the Holy Spirit who has adopted us. And has caused us to become the children of God. And so this is one of the ways you also can know you have received what you have asked for. Because it is God's will that your spouse be saved through you. That obey him. And so his will also tells us in Ephesians. What he wants for our marriages. Praise the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5 tells us again. In verse 31, as the scriptures say, meaning as God says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. Now, let me pause here. This is God's commands, people of God. This is his will. In fact, we even read it back in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. God does not want us to leave our spouse. And then is where it says, but if we do, let us remain single or else be reconciled back to them as God caused reconciliation through our praying. Now, so we know what God's will is. So with us standing in the gap, praying for this to be done, God will hear us. God wants your spouse saved and wants you one with them. For this is a great mystery. This is what God is able to do in our life when we ask him for it. And cause our marriages to illustrate Christ and the church united into one. Whereas a man love his wife as Christ loved the church, his body. And so a man is called and ordered by God and commanded by God to do the same things. Love his wife as he loves himself. Love his wife as Christ loves the church. And a wife, and a wife must love her husband as she loves the Lord, as the church loves the Lord. And so this is a great mystery. This is what is a marriage. This is a true marriage. Our marriages were designed, they were given to us to illustrate Christ and the church united into one. It's to show us the way love, the way God loves his people. And so we must ask God for it. Those that are in the kingdom of God has a right to ask God for these things. Hallelujah. It is God's will that your marriage prosper and your spouse come to the knowledge of truth and your children. Praise the Lord. And so we also can see that this is the truth. It, pre it pleases the Lord. If we look at it again in 1 Timothy, you all know this verse as well. These verses, chapter 2, verse 1 tells us, Paul says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. He's talking to the body of Christ. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. So you're supposed to be praying, praying for your children, praying for your spouse, praying for all people that you see need God's help. Intercede on their behalf and thank God for them. Well, why should we thank God for them? Because you have received it. Because he's given it to you. Because it is yours. Hallelujah. And so now you thank God for the people you want him to help. Praise the Lord. You thank God for the people that he's, uh, he's saving on your behalf of you praying for them. 
on the behalf of you praying for them. Thank God for them. And so whenever we pray, we are to thank God for what he has given us. When you pray, you are receiving. Therefore, you thank God for it. Hallelujah. And then the Bible goes on and tells us in verse 2, pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is the type of privileges and benefits we have. We can not only, we not only can just pray for our household to be saved, but leaders in our nations. We can pray for all people. This was, this is what would bring godliness and peace. Hallelujah. On the earth and in our lives and in our homes and in our relationships. This is what would set the captives free. God will help them and deliver them and save them and bring them out of the power of the enemy. Bring them from up under that power. Bring them from up, up under that control. Bring them out of darkness. For the Bible tells us in verse 3, look at it. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. And who is that? The man Christ Jesus. In verse 6, he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. So, people of God, we see that this is what pleases God. And so when we ask for God to save and deliver our loved one, bring our spouse out, bring your children out, whatever you are going through, God will hear and answer that prayer. But you must believe. You must believe that he will do it. Believe that it is done and you will have it, Jesus says. And so the word shows us how we have it. First of all, all you have to do is be in Christ Jesus. The promises are yours. You are a joint heir with Christ Jesus. Therefore, you can ask of anything and it will be given. You can ask of anything that is good and pleasing unto God and it will be given. And so you take your authority. You say, no devil, get behind me. I have received what God has given me. No doubts, no ifs, no ands and buts about it. My Lord Jesus Christ has shown me who I am in him. And what all I have been given. And as long as I know the truth, the truth has set me free. I am a joint heir with Christ Jesus. I am not a slave. I can come boldly to the throne of grace and receive mercy in time of need and trouble, the Bible tells us. And so standing in the gap, people of God, all it takes is you, just one you. Remember in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 1 tells us, look at it. Run up and down every street in Jerusalem, says the Lord. Look high and low. Search throughout the city. If you can find even one just and honest person, I will not destroy the city. So all it takes is one. This is why we can look at what it said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15 and 16. If that spouse do walk out and refuse to receive the Lord as their savior, God can save them through you. God can save them through you. And this is why we see what Paul wrote to Timothy, pray for all the people, ask God to help them intercede on their behalf. This is what pleases the Lord. And so the Lord is looking for who will intercede on their behalf and who else can better intercede on your spouse behalf, but you and your children. Who else is going to pray for your children and your spouse like you? No one else. You is that one God has called, my God, to intercede on their behalf. That's all it takes is that one you. You is truly like that savior for them. You is like that priest for them. You is like the one who's in between that can go to God on their behalf, who is our mediator, who joins us back to the Father. For the Lord tells us, without me, no man can come unto the Father. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except by me. But it's going to take us playing a part in that. We have to pray that are on this earth so those things that are in heavenly places can be on this earth. Hallelujah. Your marriage was called to illustrate Christ and the church united into one. Your marriage was called, your husband was called, woman of God, to love you as Christ loved the church. All it takes is you to stand in the gap for that to happen. Same with you, man of God, that wife of yours, we saw it. Who God has called her to be, someone to respect you and look to you, someone that she can, someone looking to you, she can count on to be her spiritual head, someone to love her as you love your own body. That is what your marriage is called to be like. Hallelujah. God says, believe you received it. But if we don't know who we are, we are no better off than a slave. If we don't come to the knowledge of truth, we can't receive. When we don't truly know what all we have been given. When we don't know who we truly are in Christ Jesus, our thoughts and our own way of thinking will fight against us and keep us from receiving what has already been given. This is why Paul says, even though that child has received everything and own it all, but until they can come to the truth and truly understand what's theirs, they would be no better off than a slave. They won't be able to receive. Well, that's how we will be in the spirit. We won't be able to receive our inheritance if we don't know the truth. If we don't see, if we're not fully persuaded or convinced through the word of God, if we're not having the understanding and the revelation about what the scripture says, we will stay in bondage. The enemy will continue stealing and robbing. And, and our loved ones won't be able to come out because there won't be any faith. If we don't know the truth, only the truth produces faith. Hallelujah. When you can see those things that you are hoping for, when you can see how God can do it, that is what produces faith. My God. And this is why the scriptures were written. They were written to teach us. And to show us what God has in store for us. To give us hope and encouragement. And to help us wait for those promises to be fulfilled in our life. The word of God is what can help us see the fulfillment of, God, of God's word in our life. And his blessings in our life. It is no way that we can receive the blessings unless we hear the truth we need to see what is on god's mind what is god's will what is god saying how can god do it when we can find the answers my god and they are written when you allow the holy spirit to lead you through the scriptures and teach you this is how faith comes faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of god you're not just hearing but you are getting an understanding as you hear. You are getting information which brings revelation. Hallelujah. And then you can bring declarations and be able to declare what's coming your way. Without a revelation, there can be no true declarations out of faith. You got to get an understanding first. Then you can declare and decree a thing and it will be established. But the decrees cannot come if there is no revelation, if there is nothing to believe, if, if there is no understanding, no wisdom, if there is no knowledge of truth. You can't believe in something you don't understand and you don't see your way through it. When you don't see your way coming out of it, when things don't make sense. The enemy will keep you in darkness and blindness and he will continue bringing forth things to fight us in our minds. But when you have an understanding and know the kingdom of God 
and how it is set up and what God has given you, you can wage a good warfare against your enemy with the word of God. You can bring these things that are fighting you in your mind. You can bring them into captivity. You can bring these things into its right place. Praise the Lord. And you can resist the devil with the word of God, with the truth. And this is what will set you free when you could see your way out. See, the enemy wants us ignorant. But the Lord will not leave us ignorant. Praise the Lord. He says, I've called you to be wiser than the serpent and harmless as a dove. It is through wisdom that we overcome him, people of God. And so, when we do these things, this is how you know what is yours. This is how you can receive and believe that when you pray, you have received. When you know the truth about what God says about your marriage. And what all you can ask him for. And why you can ask him for these things. And who you are. And why Why would all these things be given unto you. When you can answer these questions. My God you can become fully convinced. This is what happened with Abraham. The Bible says he was able to receive the promise. Because he was fully convinced. God was able to renew his mind. And show him things to come. And the Lord began to show Abraham who he was, how he was becoming the father of many nations and why, you see, and who Sarah was, my God. This is why they was able to believe God when they saw who God was and why God called them and how God was even able to raise the dead. They was able to believe that God can, can cause life to come into their bodies even at the age of a hundred years old when Sarah was 90 they saw how God was able to do it praise the Lord hallelujah and when you can see what God is able to do you can trust God this is what causes the glory to come forth but we must make sure we are doing things that are pleasing unto God because the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 11 let's go back to verse 24 and look at 25. He says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, he says, first, forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your father in heaven will forgive your sins too. And so the Lord is showing us until we are walking in forgiveness. We can't pray and ask the Father for anything. Because if we are not forgiving others, God won't forgive us. And this is what will hinder our prayers. You see, so we have to make sure that we are doing things that are pleasing unto God. It tells us this as well in Job 22, that we must make sure that we are living a life that is pleasing unto God. And then in verse 28 it says, then we can decree and declare a thing and it will be done. The Bible tells us, hallelujah. Actually, in Job 22, verse 21 says, submit to God and you will have peace. And then things will go well for you. Listen to his instructions in verse 22. In verse 22, it says, listen to his instructions and store them in your heart. And if you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. So clean up, so clean up your life. And the Bible tells us if we skip down, what happens when we do these things? Verse 28, thou, verse 27 says, thou shall make thy prayer unto him and he shall hear thee. Hear thee. And thou shalt pay thy vows, and thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. And the Bible says, and when men are cast down, then thou shalt say, there is lifting up, and he shall save the humble person, and he shall deliver the island of the innocent, and it is delivered by the pureness of of thine hands. 
And so the Lord is saying, we have submitted unto him and obeyed him. When there is no unforgiveness in our hearts or grudges towards other people, God will hear us. He'll hear us if we obey him. And you know, the word of God tells us this as well in 1 John. Let's go back. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 says this as well. The Bible tells us this in verse 21. Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence and we will receive from him whatever we ask. Why? Because we obey him and do the things that pleases him. And this is his command. It tells us in verse 23, we must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Those who obey God's commands remain in fellowship with him and he with them. And we know he lives in us because the spirit he gave us lives in us. So all those that obey God lives in God and have fellowship with him. And the word is telling us that they are the ones who can ask God for anything because they obey God by believing in Jesus Christ. And loving one another. And so this is why the Lord tells us back in Mark. When you pray. Okay you can pray for anything. But make sure your heart is right. Make sure. That there is no unforgiveness or bitterness. You see. Otherwise the father he says. Won't forgive you. This will stop our prayers people of God. And so. We who are in Christ Jesus. Who obey the Lord. Obey his commands. We can decree and declare a thing and it will be done. We can also pray for anything that pleases the Lord. He will hear us. And we can receive all that we've asked for. Oh, praise the Lord. And so this is why in John, John tells us the same things. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. John, let me go to it real quick. John chapter 15 tells us in verse 16. You didn't choose me, he says. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. That means show love, walk in righteousness, walk in kindness and meekness and forgiveness and temperance and self-control, all the fruits. Well, why, he says, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for, using my name. This is my commandment. In verse 17, he says, love each other. So we can see how God will not answer every prayer. People of God, we cannot let people tell us these things. and Don't let no one deceive you. God don't hear everybody's prayer. We have heard these things. You know, it's okay, just pray. No, it's a way we pray. We have to have the right posture. Our hearts has to be right and in alignment with God. We have to be someone that is pleasing God for him to hear us. We cannot stand in the gap for others if we're not obeying God ourselves. Remember what the Lord says. Get the speck out of our own eyes first. Then we can see past it enough to help someone else. And so it's by our pure hands, our righteousness, us who are in Christ, we can pray and ask of anything. Hallelujah. God will hear us. And so all we have to do is confess our faults. God is faith and just to forgive us. All we have to do is find it in our hearts to want to do what God says. God will hear and answer our prayers when we bring forth fruit, walking in obedience. Praise the Lord. That breakthrough is on the way. God wants you to believe you've received it. But it's impossible to do that if you don't know who you are. You know, if you don't know if it's God's will for the things you are asking him for, this will bring confusion and doubt and unbelief. You won't be able to know you received it that way. My God, I'm telling you, people of God, I declare marriages are being healed in Jesus name. Thank you, Father God. Now I'm going to pray, people of God. Thank you, Father God, for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord God. 
We praise your name, Lord. Yes, let your will be done, Father. On this earth as it is in heavenly places. Oh, Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. Giving you every broken marriage. We praise you. We thank you that you have allowed us to come before your throne, Lord God. In Jesus' name, to ask of anything that is according to your will and you will hear us. We praise you, Father God. And so every marriage, Lord, we give to you now. I stand, Lord God, with every believer. Lord God, we are trusting you that there is coming healing and breakthrough. We receive it in Jesus' name that spouses be saved and delivered and set free, that there will be restoration and healing and deliverance in every marriage and home, Lord. We praise you and thank you for it. Well, husbands will love their wives as they love their own bodies. And wives will be submitted to their own, own husbands in everything. Lord, we thank you for this peace and reconciliation that you have given us through your blood in our homes and our marriages. Where our loved ones can be saved and healed and delivered and set free. We ask it all in Jesus' name, Father. And I also pray for everyone, Lord God, that is believing. You for financial breakthroughs, anyone, Lord God, as well, that is believing because they have been sown, Lord God, sown into your work, Lord, bless the works of their hands, whatever they are believing for, Lord God, whether it is for their marriage or their finances, bless them, my Lord, bless them for being a blessing in Jesus name, Father, we give you the praise and thank you for everyone, Lord, that you have allowed to join this channel. That you have allowed to be a blessing to this channel. Thank you for them all, Lord. Those that have been a blessing even in the past, Lord. From the beginning, whether it is now or been in the past. Bless them, Lord. In Jesus' name. And Lord, we give you the praise. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. That shall follow us all that are in Christ Jesus all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Jesus. And we call it all done, Lord, in your precious holy name. We worship you and adore you. Thank you for who you have called us to be. And all the people of God that agree says amen. Amen and amen and amen. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You people of God, trust him. This is how you know you've received. Keep meditating on the scriptures. Keep meditating on what God has said about you. Allow his word to penetrate deep into your heart. To penetrate deep into your heart. That revelation will come forth. But this is his promise. Just know who you are. That's all it takes. Know who you are. The devil is under your feet, people of God. Get ready for what's coming your way. These promises are yours. Hallelujah. That are in Christ Jesus. Remember that God loves you. And I love you too, people of God. And until next time, bye-bye.